Hi. Okay. We'll go ahead and get started and people can can join in. Um, so welcome everyone to the Nubian Languages series. Um, today we'll be starting off with a historical context, speaking on multiculturalism in ancient Nubia and the importance of Nubian languages generally. Um, we have Ustaz Nubintod Khalid, um, a linguist, a scholar, and founder of the Nubian Language Society based in Washington, D.C. Um, this is a bit of a description on the of the Nubian Language Society. They're an NGO based in the U.S., um, which engages in the study, documentation, and promotion of Nubian languages and culture, and safeguarding um, the Nubian intangible heritage, um, doing really important work to preserve our languages and our culture. Um, so yeah, Nubintod, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sister Lena. Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session about the Nubian languages. Uh, if you don't mind, I can... Uh, I can... Somebody can share my screen. And... Okay. So welcome everybody, really privileged to be among you today. And I will be honored to give this presentation on behalf of the Nubian Language Society. And uh, I changed the topic slide a bit uh, because I've been talking about multiculturalism uh, in the last five years. And today I'm going to talk generally about the Nubian languages as an example of an African uh, languages and how they preserve this cultural heritage and philosophy and their own worldview. And we can exemplify Nubian as one of the existing Nubian languages still spoken in the Nile Valley, as one of those languages who bear this cultural traditions and philosophy of the ancient Nubian and the ancient Africa and the pre colonial Africa. And we can see how the ancient African, and not only exclusively to the Nubian, but inclusively spoken about the African race, how they can, how their worldview based on this ancient, uh, you know, uh, uh, exist still existing culture so let me start with a shocking slide the very sad news i want to convey today yes our the status of our african languages today is not pleasant we africans have been deprived of our own uh, usage of the african languages we don't enjoy that because of many reasons. Colonization is one of them, uh, slavery uh, and cultural hegemony inside and outside the mother continent. So all these colonizers, when they come to Africa, they impose their own uh, languages and consequently our languages, our African languages is not within the international list of languages of today, uh, speaking about English, French, which is widely spoken in Africa, Arabic among Arabic, Dutch, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and many languages. And those are considered international. And comparing to our African existing languages of today, which are not even recognized as official language in its own uh, lands, its own states. Uh, well, Africa is very diverse. It's very rich with languages. And sadly, the our children of today, they don't enjoy this 
you know uniqueness and uh, uh, of their la of their own tongues and uh, Africa as a continent and a mother of many African family, of many languages family, today is being, we can say, lingually colonized, still not free. So the freedom of Africa will come when the African mind can in, enjoy and express their own self by their own language. And the language has a lot of, you know, uh, functions beyond just the communication. The, the language is our own, bears our own vision to the world, as we can see through the slides of today. So I would like to take you to a tour of ancient Nubia. And this, I hope you will enjoy this tour. So I'm going to start with uh, the greetings. So I'll teach you uh, how we greet each other. You see this old man in ancient Nubia of today is welcoming you all, all the Africans of today, all Sudanese and Africans of today, Maskagjilo, Maskagjilo, do you keep the spirit of goodness? This is literally translated like that. So Maskagjilo, the spirit which created this uh, great ancient civilization, the spirit that creates Nubia is the spirit of goodness. And, and let's say, welcome to Nubia. Nubal Tochimino. And Nubia of today is contained in Sudan and beyond. So when we say Nubia, we talk about, because everybody will think of Nubia as a small region between Egypt and Sudan, and particularly in South Egypt and North Sudan. But this is not the fact. The fact is, Nubia is an ancient region that, ex that extended beyond Sudan. So it has, it has many borders, and it's not only what the Western, uh, you know, scholars have described that between the first cataract in Aswan to the sixth cataract in Khartoum, actually, this is the colonial definition of the Nubian region. However, we Africans and we are the Nubians of today, we have preserved our uh, own definition for Nubia that is not exclusive as the colonial, you know, vision or the colonial uh, scholarship has defined and presented to the world. It's it's the whole land of Sudan and beyond. We have many Nubian nations that live in Ethiopia, in, in Eritrea, the Anara, Ethiopia, the Moro. We have many Nubian nations scattered all over the continent uh, because of the invasion. Many of the Nubian uh, communities have left this region, but this region is still exists and prevalent to, to keep you know, the, the history and to keep the archaeology of Nubia and to be a witness for a great civilization of the past. Uh, this Dancing of Nubia in the Nile Valley between Egypt and Sudan has a bigger belongingness to the whole continent, to the whole motherland of Africa. As you see, the decoration of Nubia, you can find it somewhere in the West Africa, in the East. It's very common and is still uh, uh, present of today as, as a symbol of the existence of an ancient and great time of Africa, and the shining time of Africa. Sadly, in, in the 60s, in the early 60s, there was a crisis in Nubia due to the construction of the high dam. And the construction of the high dam resulted 
in a humanitarian crisis that many, many or large numbers of the, the Nubian uh, families and native speaker of Nubian forced to move away from their motherland. And sadly, since that time, the region has suffered a lot and a lot of uh, archaeological sites and important significant places, historical places have been submerged uh, with under underwater and uh, because of and rich monuments. And uh, I think the UNESCO in the 60s have launched a campaign called uh, The Salvation of Nubia. And that his first mission, actually, when they just been formed, the UNESCO organization, the, Inter the UN organization. And after their, they, they try to preserve some of the intangible, tangible heritage, the archaeological sites. But the most significant and most important to the humanity is the intangible heritage which is the culture, the environment, and the, the human heritage. And it's still it's endangered now, and it's still going through loss from years to years, from decades to decades. And that was one of the biggest crises occurred, uh, happened in the 60s in Sudan and Egypt for this African heritage, or the ancient African heritage in Nubia. Okay. Also, struggles not only with the crisis, like the construction of dams, but also the policy of the countries. Talking about the Sudanese side, because the Egyptian side, and I have we have our own experience in Sudan since the independence. Sudan is a state where in Africa we had independence in the fifties, like nineteen fifty six, and since then, Sudan adopted, you know different ideology uh, called Arabism, adopted the Arab uh, ideology and have announced Sudan to be an Arab state and a socio-political, ethno-centric ideology called Arabism to, you know, to define a country. That reflect forcefully for, you know, considering the collective, uh, central collective identity to be as an Arab, and this will definitely endanger other identities, ancient identities like the Nubians. So uh, the Arabic language have been dominant in the state of the diverse African languages in Sudan, and anything else being marginalized in, in that process, the Nubians, the language of interest was one of the marginalized uh, languages in Sudan and as a result of that it's endangered today in danger today and we're going to talk about the details of the speakers and how the degree of endangers um, so as I've mentioned since the 50s children were banned to speak their mother tongues in the schools being punished to do that and this humiliation definitely has consequences and impact and implications on how the language develop. If the, the child thought that he will not enjoy, he thought he, he cannot speak the language in the school, this means that he will not enjoy or think of his own language as like equal or important or significant. That means he will look at his own culture inferior to the dominant culture. And that's exactly what happened. So since then, Nobin among other indigenous African languages in Sudan, have suffered from the same problem and not recognized in the state. We have individual you know, attempts like the Nubian Lang Society to do this work, like to document the this ancient African uh, languages in the Nile Valley and beyond and in other regions I will explain. And to end this, you know, through our own means to resist this racist, you know, behavior and policy from the government. So we took initial step and we talked about the most significant thing is the language. 
And we had our own definition for the language, that the language is our own identity. Why we call the language is our own identity and why do we mean by that? Our language is our identity because it bears our unique cultural genes. So each uh, culture in the world has its own genes and the language can bear these genes, can bear these genes, can, can identify these people based on these cultural genes, based on this culture, you know, behaviors and culture identification. The whole world of things is represented mentally through the language. So the language is a powerful tool that the human can have their own perception of the word, okay, can see the word through their language they express. The language is the first production of any human society. So when we talk about productivity of Africa, why Africa is lacking behind, because Africa has been deprived from expressing itself fully like any other continent. The African mind, if they've been given, granted this, you know, this freedom to be like equally treated as other uh, minds of the world. So you see the Japanese, have they have, they enjoy their own productivity through their own means, through their own language, their own culture. The Chinese, everybody's doing that except us. We in Africa, we have to be British or French or Arabs or whatever, just to, to be ourselves. So there is a big disconnection between the mind and the human. So, and that's what reflect in the productivity, okay? So our cultural uniqueness as a society in Africa is not granted through years. Language is a symbol, symbolic signifier of our collective identity. So of the country like Sudan is, is adopting a false identity, this will impact on the people, on the humans, on the minds, because we had through many years and centuries and maybe uh, millennia have, have developed a different mean, different perception, different view, different ideas, different, you know, uh, different, different concepts of everything. And we agreed and we have conventionally agreed to do that. And those words and sound are just not only for communications. They, they bear witness to uh, his, history, big history. So if we have been disconnected from all of that, definitely we, we feel like we are, we are strangers to our own environment, to our own means, to our own self. So language express the symbolic cultural autonomy cultural independence and cultural intellectuality, freedom of intellectuality. So um, I'm using now English as maybe maybe the, uh, my third or fourth language. It's not my even first, so I cannot express myself fully like the native speakers of English. And imagine if I'm given this, you know, uh, being... I mean, talking, being granted to give this, you know, uh, session in, in, in Nobin or in our native language, one of our native African language, and the audience enjoy the same thing. So definitely the ideas will be very different. And that's exactly what happens. So be all the people enjoy their freedom, except us. So it's not only the political independence, it's also the cultural independence. So language can have this dimension, can lead you to this, this dimension of freedom, and which we, we are lacking behind, behind the world now because of that. So uh, let's go and talk about Nubia. Nubia is the ancient land of civilization. civilization. I think uh, you have encountered many articles, maybe you visited museums, you found many posts in the internet, you have met some Nubians who are talking about Sudanese people. So when we talk about Nubia, we talk about ancient African civilization. It's not only it's exclusive for the, the region of Nubia, North Sudan, or it's not only for the Sudanese, for the whole Africans. But when we think of Nubia of today, let's think of Sudan whole Sudan, of its own diverse languages and regions and, you know, climates and cultures, very big one. 
So this are the birth uh, place for many unique things in the history of humanity. Um, uh, Nubia, the birth of the ancient, you know, goddess, female goddess. Nubia, the ancient of, uh, you know, cities, <laughs> okay, cosmopolitan cities, very ancient, okay. Nubia, the ancient of religion, uh, place of ancient religions and temples. The idea of the uh, of the Jewish temple of today resembles the Ammonite temple, the temple of Amun. Okay, back in the days, they have everything. Temple itself, the idea of the temple, divided in three areas, and the last is the uh, sacred of the sacred or the holy of the holies. All these ideas came from ancient Nubian Egypt. And all these ideas came. So Nubia is the mother land of Kemet, is the ancient land of or the birthplace of many unique ideas which impacted the humanity. So Nubia is very diverse. Some maybe are gonna come across some of the topics, multiculturalism. Yes, Nubia is very diverse, like the ancient. Nubia, one of the ancient Nubian civilization, Karma, the, the city of the Fufa. So the Karmite civilization was the home of diverse cultural groups and ethnicities. So Karma, oh, that was, let's say, uh, like at least 3000 BC, was established through the union of several independent states and chiefdoms and diverse ethnicities. So the concept of multiculturalism is embedded within Nubia. So you cannot say those are unique Nubian traditions. Nubia is very diverse, very diverse. It has its own multiple forms, multiple languages, okay? Multiple ideas. And this is how Africa is very unique in you know, developing its own culture compared to the to the to the other nations, you know, way. When Africa developed a civilization, that means um, multicultural communities, like multiple of communities with their different behavior, different culture, different religions, they unite peacefully and form the civilization. So the karma as a good example for that. Here, for, for the other nations, especially in Asia and Europe, uh, particularly, so they have to be a dominant race who imposes its own language, its own culture on everyone, and then develop the colonization based on, develop the civilization based on its own colonial or imposing on everybody so this is and 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 the multiculturalism versus the monoculture okay and then you can see this example in the roman empire in the greek civilization in those ancient uh, european civilizations compared to the african in the ancient african civilizations so so the fufa in in North Sudan, in the area of uh, by North to Dongola, is considered one of the earlier cosmopolitan city, and that where diverse culture coincided together peacefully, and it was like a a, a landmark for trade, international trade. That trades come from Africa to Africa, back and forth, and and that's why you see here today. We have Nubians in the north, we have Nubian in Muba Mountain, we have Nubian everywhere, and they are very unique, and they all call themselves Nubian, and they all enjoy the Nubian culture, the, the name of Nuba. Okay. And and everybody recognizing everybody. Okay. Nubia is the birthplace of historical writing systems. You see the the hygrographic um well, oh, it's between Sudan and ancient Egypt, Kemite and Nubia, the Kemet and Nubia. So ancient kingdom of Kush, which is also 
a little alternative name for Nubia, Kushland or ancient Sudan. And when I say Nubians, I talk about the ancient Kushite, all the Nubians, no exclusive, very diverse. Use this heliographic writing, okay? So it's a picture writing. And then later they developed the Merwatic, okay? Which is an abjad writing system. It's uh, in, in Merwi, like a later civilization. And this is considered one of the unique, you know, uh, writing script, you know, back in the days that this region not only developed civilization in the context of religion and the context of ag agriculture, but also writing. Writing is very important because when the writing starts, the history starts. So those are one of the ancient writers, the nations in the, you know, in the history of humanity. And uh, those are very complex, you know, systems and used in, in the temples, used in the ordinary life, used in the royal uh, correspondences. And later in the Christian era, Nubia had been Christianized, you know, Orthodox Christianity, Oriental Christianity, just like the Ethiopians and the Eritrean. And they adopted um, the Greek alphabet with some Coptics, like Copts coming from Egypt, modern Egypt, Copts, Coptic modification. And this is how the, the recent, like this is the last form of writing look like. And they have kept some of the Meroitic shapes, some of the Meroitic symbols, three Meroitic symbols. And those actually uh, together known as the Old Nubian script or the Old Nubian writing system. It's a very unique writing system and it's been documented, it's found in the archaeology, it's been documented by many Western scholars. Okay, famous one of them, Brown in, from the United States, who developed an Old Nubian dictionary. And we have Griffiths from UK who worked in this, uh, the corpus and worked in the old text of Nubia long time. So the Nubian script is very unique and, and both, uh, unique and can be identified and distinguished from the other Copt, Coptic or Greek because of the calligraphy and orthography of and the use of unique symbols like the Meroitic symbols. So Giving you also example of uh, introduction about Nobin. Nobin is a language of today. The language of interest is today is a still existing language, the indigenous tongue of the Nile Nubian and Mahas area, Sukkot and Halfa in Northern Sudan and Fadicha in South Sudan. So this region here only shrunk to this region. Maybe we don't know the history back in the days it was spoken, widely spoken uh, through this region. But uh, the word Nobin itself come from, is derived from the word Nob. And Nob has a plural form is Nobi. And we have the N as a genitive marker. So Nob, the meaning of Nob means the indigenous denizen or inhabitant of Lower Nubia. The indigenous black inhabitant of Lower Nubia. Then Nobi is a plural, the indigenous inhabitants or denizens of Lower Nubia. And then the N is a, a genitive marker that means belongs to those. So this Nobin or Nobin is a language belong to those black indigenous inhabitants of Lower Nubia. And maybe we can just say the tongue of the black inhabitants. So Nob uh, bears also the you know, the identity of this African, you know, inhabitants of Lower Nubia. And the Nubian family, the Nubian family belongs to a big phylum of languages. When I say phylum, a big family of languages called the Nilo Saharan. And the Nilo Saharan is one of the ancient, uh, one of the bigger family in Africa. It's only in Africa that has. We can't find it in any other continent. And with the Nilo-Saharan, it's 
there is a subfamily of subgroups called the Eastern Sudanic. And within the Eastern Sudanic, we, there is a Northeastern Sudanic. And within the Northeastern Sudanic, you find the Meroitic language as a family, uh, as a mother tongue of this Nubian families. So the Nubian family, uh, Nubian belongs to this Nubian family, and the Nubian family of languages, small Nubian family of languages, but has many languages still existing, and still covering the whole uh, land of Sudan. In the north, we we find we we find the Nubian and the old Nubian, maybe old Nubian, it's still like a puzzle. Many people claim that this is uh, just a textual. Uh, language, but in less in in some of the classifications of Western, they classified as a Northern Nubian. In the West, in the Western Nubian group, we find the Tidnal, which is the middle, and this or in the in the northern part of Darfur. So you see, Darfur is part of Nubia. So, and the Central Nubia. Languages you find the Birgit is in the western and southern Darfur. So you see, we have two Darfurian Nubian existing Nubian languages as, as still as an evidence that this is a big African state, it's not just exclusive to the to the north. And then we have the Andandi, which is the in the land of Dungula and the, the it's uh, in the Nile Valley. So southern to the south and to here, you find this, you know, Dungulawi. This is Andandi. This is the Midob in here, or Tidnal. Midob is a, is a land, and Tidnal, which is the native, they call them their language Tidnal, the language of, him, of the man. And this is the Birgit in southern Darfur, center and central Darfur. And we found also the Ajan group. The Ajan, uh, the, the linguists of today, they call them Hill Nubia. They are in Nuba Mountain. And the Ajan group uh, exists, uh, centralized among uh, a small town in Sudan called Dilenj. Okay, in the Arabic Sudan, they call it the Dilenj. Dilenj. So in Dilenj, west and south Dilenj, you found the Ajan group. Okay, and there are so many very diverse, at least 26 tongue, Nubian tongue there in Nuba Mountain. So you see here, in the land of Sudan of today, still keep, preserve this Nubian heritage all over its land. They all enjoy the same, you know, value, the same culture, the same history, the same, you know, either in the north center, like Nuba Mountain or in the west, everybody, uh, enjoying, okay, their Nubian belongingness and Nubian identity. And this is very diverse, very diverse uh, Nubia of today. So talking about the Nubian languages, the Nubian languages are so symmetrical, They're very identical. And I don't know, There is this is a puzzle for linguists. We don't know the reason why. Those are so isolated, and as you see here, very isolated, especially in Sudan of today, because of the war, because of many boundaries, because of the policy of the government the, and the colonization even before the, the independence. They're so isolated, but they still have a strong connection linguistically, and we try to understand this phenomena for us. It's a puzzle. And talking about, giving an example here, of you know this phrase here, uh, giving you an example here, and this phrase in English being translated to uh, some Nubian language, some Nubian tongues. I drank water, and you see here the symmetricity. Nubian is the northern example of the Nile Valley. Uh, I amanga nis. So you see the verb comes at the end. The object in the center and the subject in the start. And the subject is a pronoun and the pronoun almost identical, all this language. And the object is marked. And you see, almost with the same consonant. Okay, this velar. 
Okay, maybe nasalized in the case of Nobi, maybe just voiced in the case of other languages, but maybe voiceless in the case of all Nubian, but they always have to be like a marker in the plural, and the, and the verb comes at the end. And then the verb comes at the end almost identically. See the verb, either ni or di, maybe di is dialectal difference, but yeah, and then the conjugation of the verbal suffixes and everything comes at the end. And then this is very, this symmetricity and in linguistic being preserved through all these years, the construction of, this Nubi, of the Nubia and the sentence in all these Nubian languages. Why it kept like that? Why this language are very symmetrical and, and uniquely symmetrical, not only in the context of lexical, lexically symmetrical, but also in the context of grammar. So this is very unique. And looking also at the uh, lexical side, just um, picking here the family words, we call them in linguistic kinship terms. So you see here how this language are very unique, like Nobin in the north, Birgit in Darfur, Mido in Darfur, and Dandi or uh, Kenzi in, 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 in the Nile, and Ajing in Nuba Mountain. And you see how sometimes, see here, Fab the Birgit is more close to Nubin, Northern, than the me than the the Andandi, which I'm both uh, the Nile. This is in Darfur. Okay. And you see here Ain is common. And the idea also is the kinship terms is very significant. If you you find closeness in the in the kinship uh, in the in the family words, that means those languages are like cousins, <laughs> sister and brothers. Okay, and Nobin also bear strong among other. When I talk about Nobin, if Nobin has this connection, that means the rest of the language also had the same, enjoy the same thing. So Nobin an as an example, I'm just giving it as an example, has a strong con linguistic connection to Meroetic. This is what we found. This is one of my comparisons that I did. Just pick some of the the words like from different semantic domains and I, you know, family, you know, verbs, and <laughs> idiomatic words and, you know, from everything, just a cocktail of words. And I try to do this comparison and I found a strong comparison between the Meroitic language and Novin. And then this is not all seem, also not only my claim, but also other, you know, Western scholar claim that this French guy, Claude Rilly, also did uh, said the same thing in, in his publication in 2009. And uniquely speaking about phonology in Nobin so, and Meroetic, so the Nobin has 24 sounds. This is what we have found in the inventory when we studied the phonology of Nobin, the phonemic inventory, compared to 23 sounds in the Meroetic. So this make uh, you know, make this language very close to each other. And both they enjoy also other phonological, you know, you know similarities, like the they don't have the voiced fricatives like Z and Z, because those sound are not existing in Novin, both Novin and Meroetic. So we can consider Meroetic as the mother of Novin and mother of all Novin languages. And this uh, compares and Nobin is a genderless language, convey unique definition of social equality. And here I'm going from this slide onwards to, ex to expand on how the language can convey the perception of its own unique society. Why we're being deprived from, from expressing that because of the influence of the lingual influence and the cultural influence of the colonizers. So Nubian, like any other Nilo-Saharan language and Nubian languages, say, is absolute genderless. When I say genderless, that means it doesn't uh, appreciate gender, does not recognize gender in all its grammatical cases. No, no, there is no gender. And it has a single third person pronoun, ter, 
So Ter, we say Ter in Novin, and Ter is the third person. And this replaces the three third persons that you know, she, he, she, he, and it. We know she is feminine, he is masculine, and it for neutral. So we have three genders, at least in English, compared to one gender in Novin. So all these three are replaced in the language by Ter. So when I say Ter, it could be a man, a feminine, could be a masculine, could be a thing, like an object, whatever. So what does implies what this and there's the unity of human mankind. When I say ter, he and she is just ter. That means this language and keeps the perception of equality among human kinds. And today we struggle with you know women of uh, equality and struggle with man man and women. And I and you see here within uh, its own type, man. And, but to see here, we have immunity because of the culture, because the culture is reflected on the language. It represents the perception of Nubian culture that based on the unification of human with other components of the nature. Like not only the man and woman are equal, but the man and woman in nature are all seen in this culture as united. So the man, that's why the ancient civilization, this is a big claim I know, they respect the environment. They didn't exploit the environment. They did a lot of amazing development in ancient Egypt and ancient Nubia without exploiting the environment, without colonizing the environment. Not only the human colonized, but also the environment cloned. A lot of waste coming of our civilization of today. We have corrupted the planet. But back in the days when we developed the civilization, the civilization itself does not impact you know, the environment because there, this concept is just man and nature are united. They respect, they respect. In the temples of Nubia, you found you know, everything, like all the objects, all the animals, and the human is they come at the end. So this humility of the human, the ancient human of Nubia and the ancient human of Africa, that he sees himself and she sees herself as the lowest you know, contributor to the, to the nature. Okay. Now, but in our philosophy of today, the human should come first. So he sees himself as the most the most powerful <laughs> creature of today and he had the authority to play with the planet to do whatever he can okay and he manifests his own uh, his power everywhere okay and they don't care of the consequences but back in the days if you go to the temples you see the human had been you know pictured at the lowest that means to show the humility like this temple in epidemic in and Masawarat in the northern Sudan, in the Naka, okay, no, in Nubia, northern Sudan, you see here, if you go to this temple, you see the human is being put at the end, the lowest rank of everybody, after all the sacred animals, everyone, and the sun, everyone, it's just because he's the weakest, he admits his weakness at humility and unification of nature, okay, and Nubian fosters gender equality, as we just mentioned, and we're going to expand on this ideas and this emphasizes interconnectedness with the natural world to form its own definition of egalitarianism okay we have our own form of egalitarianism our own definition of that okay um, um then think of this one here nobin conveys historical perceptions of the nile valley I'm, I'm going to read you here this, you know, <laughs> proverb, and it's still existing in our Nubian, Nubian culture of today, Nubian language of today. And the Nubian, the ancient Nubian elders still keep this proverbs. So the proverbs, uh, maybe our sister Lena can help us read this one. Maybe she's one of my students. I just want to. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, Eged. Eged, Eged, Egeddan, 
جام فاق فاق إدان جام Thank you, thank you, Lee. So, thank you. So, eged, eged danjam, fag, faged danjam. Okay, so eged is the sheep. As you see here in the picture. So, this is the sheep. Okay. And fag, faged danjam. Fag is the, the other animal, which is the goat. So, the goat versus the sheep. So, literally, this verb means... The goat with the sheep with the, with the sheep gathers and the goat with the, with the goat gathers. And the, what does that mean? And what implication here? So the sheep in the Nubian culture represents this or symbolize the, the spirit of goodness. Remember when I spoke in the beginning, the greetings, Maska Jilo. Do you keep the spirit of goodness? Okay. So the spirit of goodness is symbolized in the form of, you know, of a sheep. And the god Amun, the, 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 the ancient god of the Nile Valley, Amun, have been pictured or depicted in the form of a sheep, okay? So the sheep with the sheep gathers, okay? All the goodness gather. And then, and the other side, the evil, the set, okay? And and, and 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 the other bad or evil gods gather together. And then the bad spirits gather together. The good spirit gather together. And I think this this idea or this you know mythology, okay, have impacted so many religions and so many philosophers. And and uh, this mythological representation of a sheep also was adopted by later by the Christianity and the biblical uh, text. And as you see here how the language preserve you know this unique history of Africa until today. So this is very unique. This is just one example of how Nubian language of today preserved the ancient past of Nubia. Lobin conveys many signs of maternalistic culture. And when I speak about maternalistic culture, uh, I speak about the state of motherhood. So, because the term maternalistic now means many things. I know in anthropology and in many different disciplines uh, of science it means many things, but I just simply refer to the state of motherhood, okay? And in mother, the mother in Nobin is called Ain. In many languages, as you see, and when we did the comparison between different tongues of Nubia, Ain is still the, the mother. And in, in whether it's in Nubians of Darfur or Nuba Mountain or the Nubs of the Nile, they all say the same thing, Ain. And Ain for them is very sacred title. It's not just uh, a family member. <laughs> Ain has a lot of you know, uh, a lot of implications and, and meanings, you know, and perceptions and idea. The concept of mother itself in Nobin is very unique. And it conveys, you know, this maternalistic aspect, this motherhood aspect, whenever it bears its genitive constructions. So Ain can form the family. Ain merely appears in kinship terms, in family words. And Ain uniquely done that. So the motherhood, the state of motherhood, is very center in the Nubian culture. Okay, and let's see how that. Okay, so the word Ain in all Nubian is just Ain and Nile Nubians, Hill Nubians, Darfurian Nubians, Birgit and Middle. They all have the same. They all say enjoy the same concept, the same word. Okay, and this is very unique. The word "an" appears in generally in genitive constructions, tasks is announced to form many words, either kinship words like family words, or animate nouns or inanimate nouns. Okay, let's consider that and and also link that to what we have discussed about the unity of man and nature. "An." Uh, 
is it's found in kinship terms. Maybe the, the stronger one is, I'm going to start with example number five. You can see my screen. Eden. Eden. This is the mother. This is the mother of the man, which literally means like equivalent to woman and wife. So the word woman and wife in Nobin is formed by the word man. It is man and Ain is a mother. So as if we say the man, the, the woman is the mother of the man or the wife is the mother of the man. So when the man detached from his own biological mother, he joined in a relationship with another, okay, motherhood, okay, through his wife. And that's why for the Nubian people, the marriage relation is very eternal, very sacred. We thought that because of the, the Christianity, but when later we we have they dig deep into this, we found that the culture itself is the 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 the, the place of the the woman in the society as a mother is is viewed as a mother in the marriage has really uh, big consideration to consider for the marriage so the man will be hesitant you know to do a lot of because he he respects the woman thinking like but i'm talking about example in the past now it's not the case anymore because of the arabization you know the influence of culture but i'm talking about typical nubian cultures pre-colonial cultures those the women the, the, the marriage itself very strong women are considered the mother of man you see the concept and then the woman found everywhere, like the mother of son. This is the brother. You consider your brother because he's your son, the son of your mother. Okay. So the mother is the center, key figure in the family. Okay. Everybody respect. Everybody viewed this. So, so the language bear these concepts, bear these ideas, bear this, you know, perceptions that we want that they keep it from generation to generation. So if these ideas bear in these morals, see, talking moral system being disconnected, that means we adopted a different moral system, being corrupting our own moral. So Thinking only, not only just a oh, stay away, and it's not only in the human, you know, societies, but also thinking of the other nature. Okay, the, the animate objects. Ain is also, the concept of Ain is also used to represent this dimension, you know, to express this unique relations. So, in the examples that I'm giving here, um, Okay, all the donkeys come from the mother donkey. So the, the donkey mother or the mother donkey. Okay, or the good example that I'm seeing because of the picture here. Manfantineninga gunya. Okay, look at the balm mother tree. So the balm, uh, the, the tree, the palm tree, the mother palm tree here. Palm mother tree that it can bear by its own without, you know, a male type. And the palm mother tree, this one is very unique. So you see, and, and is used to construct this idea of palm, the mother palm tree, the mother donkey, the mother sheep. Okay. So, so. The, the word Ain here means the source of life. So Ain is not just the source of life, the source of existence, the source of identity. So the concept of motherhood is so central in this culture. So same thing for the others, not only for animate objects, but also for inanimate objects. Like here, you see Diffine. Diffine means the the castle, the mother, the castle mother, or the mother castle, and in good English, the mother runlet. Okay, so Martine. So 
as if that we're thinking of this is very centralized concept idea in the moral system of Nubia, the ancient, the, the, the motherhood, the Ain. So where did this come from? The history of Nubia depicts that the source of morals in ancient Nubia comes from the from woman, the mother, the mother woman. Okay, and the, the society sees the woman as a mother, the source of life, the source of everything. So the Karmas princess, okay, the, the Karmas priests, sorry, the priests, those in the religion back in the in Nubian religion, the sacred human, okay, kind was a woman. That's why it's been, being put in, you know, because the in the ancient mm, civilization, the religious authority was superior to political authority. So thinking about the religious society that close to the God, the priests, all the priests were selected as women. So the woman, the only woman can have enjoy this place. And also uh, we went to the Nabatan area in the Kushai time, we found something called the Amun God's wife which is the highest superior you know, rank in the country, more significant than the king himself. The king has to come and intercede, you know, and ask uh, this God's, uh, among God's wife to intercede on his behalf. And, and she is very important. Only given this title to the woman. Only woman can be among God's wife. Very holy, very sacred. And later in the Christianity, we found some saints, sacred saints. It's maybe very unique in, among the Christian life of that time because it was very you know, um, masculine <laughs> uh, societies and patriarchal societies that we found uh, Christian saints like this lady. Nobody talk about her, but she's from no, from Nab from Nab from Nobatia in Faras. This lady from Faras. Faras is is let's just go back to the map to show you here where is Faras. Probably Faras is here between the borders between Sudan and Egypt in Nubia, in Nobatia. This is the Christian kingdom back in the days. And this lady, nobody knows about her. <laughs> this lady was very young in her 20s, maybe, yes, and she had submitted herself to the charity. She formed the first charity in the church. And that was in, in the 8th century. I had attended a lecture in London for a Polish scholar talking about this lady for one hour. And she was very amazed by her unique story. And she preceded everybody this long time this is long time before the red cross before any idea of ngo this lady formed a charity in the the church of forest her name is anna and this anna have dedicated her life to help the poor people to help the people in need and she and she was considered as a saint among the nubians that time and um, the Nubian of today have preserved back in the days. This is this picture is taken from Wadi Halfa before the inundation, before the sad crisis. You see here how the women are significant and uh, uh, and they kept doing, you know, those handcrafts. And this is very beautiful lady doing a long time. We don't see this continuation of the the ladies of today because you know this connection of culture. But we hope we can see the Sudanese people and the African people, you know, preserve that one. Invention of farming, invention of farming tools, farming itself as an activity, a domestic tools, and many inventions in in Karama and in Nubia. Uh, and in 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 in, 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 in decorations and ornament. Ornamental objects that was all because of this 
you know, woman mind, the Nubian woman mind, the Nub the African woman mind. That was coming from that. Okay, so the Nubian did a lot of the women did a lot of contribution to the ancient civilization of Nubia. Okay, uh, just expanding on the same idea. Uh, Ain is the source power of uh, ancient Nubi. So talking, we we talked about the wife of Amun, mother of kings. When women in ancient Nubia derive power from their roles, you know, their titles, and then kings, and symbolizing the authority and lineage, and the Merwetic Kandakas, we we have maybe you have come across that one, maybe you come across that one, the Kandaka. And Sudan in the days was ruled by women. Women ruled, they contributed in the war, they were in the political, not only that, in the ancient e Kush or Nubia, the woman was titled, you know, in, uh, in the religious, you know, authority. Now in, in Meroitic, they, 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 they replaced the man in, in the political authority and have been granted, you know, the title of the Queen Mother Kandaka. They rule their armies, the military leaders. And then now of today, until today, we have challenges to find women leading an army in our modern, as we live today, societies. But back in the days, women did a lot of amazing things. Amani Rinas, one of the Kandakas, who was who was ruling uh, her own army and defeating the Roman, you know, army in Aswan and Fela. And in the Christian era, also the the power of the queen Nubian mothers continued. And this picture depicts, you know, how strong we see here. This is the Holy Virgin in holding uh, Christ and transferring as if she's transferring the power to the queen of Nubia in the Christian era. And the queen of Nubia is taking this power to the society. So it's very materialistic, you know, view of the society. And this is how Nubia understood the Christianity through the materialism. Um, just give an example about comparison between Nubia, the Nubian motherhood, comparison between the concept of Nubian motherhood and the concept of modern Western feminism. I'm not offended, not against anything. I'm just giving historical you know, comparison between what we found in Nubia and what is existing today. The culture is genderless. Okay, and this paved the way for the woman to have its centralized position in the society with no struggles because by default, the society appreciates and consider the state of motherhood as holy, as sacred. Women ascendancy through culture. The mother is a source of morals, source, a symbol of holiness, God's defying creature, okay, is the center of the family, is everything. The source of man, of source of mind, source of creativity. The mother is a source of power. So it's already being granted this, you know, and this position with no struggle. There is no struggle between man and woman here to have this one. This in the Nubian model of the ancient past. The model of the West in you know, progressive feminism. Women exist in a man-based or patriarchal-based communities. So there is, there by default, there is a struggle between man and woman, okay, to, to, to demark the society based on shared, you know, equalities. So women have to fight for their rights, progressively, through struggle and unions and activism and laws and protesting to get this law to. They've been deprived to vote. They've been deprived, you know, to have equal uh, position in the job, you know. So it's, everything is achieved by laws. So this is, and woman fights for liberation and independence from man tyranny. 
women fights and fights for empowerment and recognition until today. So compared to the model of ancient Africa, ancient Nubia, we don't have the same thing. And maybe this is a unique difference between the civilizations. Um, status of Nubian today. So Nubian, in spite of its preservation for this unique concepts, today this language is suffering. It's considered endangered. So in 1996, the number of number of native speakers, okay, was less than 700 people in both Sudan and Egypt. Thinking about this is like long time ago, at least over than 30 years ago. Now in every decade, we we lose at least 100,000. So thinking of today, the, the threat of extinction is high and Nubian is considered a highly intelligent language. We, the Nubian Language Society, try to do some attempts, as you see here in the picture, with the children of Nubia, to the, the Sudanese children of today, the African children of today. But because of many policies and also the community self-awareness, we might not win this battle. And if this conditions continues um, by 2050, we might not see native Nubian speakers anywhere and will be completely gone. And this is sad. And that means the history of Nubia and one of the languages that bear the history of Nubia. And when I speak about Nubian, okay, status, that means the whole other Nubian families also are endangered. Some of them are even worse than Nubian because they live in the, in the areas of struggle, like in Nuba Mountain, you know, and, and in Darfur, okay. And then thinking that means Nubian or any other of these Nubian languages gone, that means the whole chapter of Nubia, this unique things that I've been talking about is gone forever, being disconnected from the word human, okay, history forever. And we, the Nubian Language Society, as our sister Lena talked, we are based in DC. We welcomed anybody to help in revitalizing the language where I'm sharing with you here, our website. You can go and see what we do for the Nubian languages. And, and we have a lot of amazing things. And we also welcome your contribution and donations, whatever. And also welcome you also as member to help you know sharing with with us this vision and help with us try to reach out and work in revitalizing and so if you are a linguist if you are a student of linguistic if you are a student of language if you're a student of anthropology or if you um if you are interested you know in all this work even if you are not i know academically attached to this and you have the interest you're welcome at any time okay to enjoy with us. So we have unique programs. We have a lot of projects, especially speaking about Nobin language, we have a unique program for Nobin. So we are working on revitalizing this language through a different unique program. We are working in the documentation project. We are working in a dictionary project. We are working in literacy project. We teach, we are working in children project. We have translation project. We have language acquisition project. And I think Lena, is enjoying one of our language acquisition class. And you are welcome guys to attend our classes. We teach Nubian for free for all African and Sudanese students. And you only have to purchase the book and then you can enjoy teaching the class. And I, you can contact Lena uh, after this class to, to show you how you can send us if you are interested to learn the language. And it definitely we, we are working on developing language applications to make it more available. So we are doing a lot of fights to fight back the this the distinction of Nobin. So hopefully we we and other people also as well who are working in other organizations, other attempts uh, can be do that. Otherwise we there is a sad consequences. So we've been doing some work in some universities here in you know, among the United States. We have been working with some young linguists and PhD students who helped us 
and doing some documentation. And Nobin, 2018, we've been teaching, you know, and with our, our teachers in, 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 in Sudan and in, 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 in outside Sudan, doing literacy program, teaching this native speaker how to read and write. And, and also we've been doing some work among children in Sudan and we have some publications and uh, for the children and this we did all we are doing also a complete Nubian language Nubian language acquisition project so that, that means teaching Nubian to non-native speakers we have three levels and we just launched the first level the beginners level and I hope you guys can come one day to our classes to enjoy learning Nubian. It's very unique. It's very nice and learn about the Nubian culture. And I'm gonna end up my talk with this work of translation that I did in 2017. It's for our great um, father of negritude, uh, Amy Cesar. And the great Amy Cesar, as you all know, is uh, is uh, the father of negritude, who did amazing work in the, the arts and bear this vision. So we did a translation, partial translation. I'm just not giving all the whole translation, just give you how the Nobin of the day, uh, if some efforts being invested can contribute to the work of translation and the arts work. And then you see here the great message that this elder African elder, an African, an elder fighter of African culture have given us. So So my blackness, okay. It's not dumb. And ugresin hujujidu tarfa mashaka jagmunna. Okay. With the sounds and and the noise of the morning time. And it is very apparent. And the sun. So urumkilani my blackness. My negritude. Okay. I'm a narkida for Kalagmunna. Just it goes just like a drop, a water drop. Okay. And Urumkilani Gurdiosi Wela Ton Munna. It's not a dead land. Okay. Tell everybody that our blackness will be kept forever and our unique shyness, our unique black shyness of the past will be kept forever and Nubia will stand for all the years and for all the centuries to be a shining place for humanity and a big lesson for everyone. Thank you guys, really honored being with you here giving this presentation. I'm going to stop sharing and I'll wait for you if you have questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Victor. I know um, I know all of us appreciated that so much and learned so much. I know everyone in the chat was talking about, you know, imagining a Sudan today where Nubian and the Nubian languages survived and were glor given their glory, you know. Um, so yeah, I think we all we all learned so much. Um, I was thinking maybe um you could speak a little bit on uh and and anyone feel free to ask questions um on mute, but if you could speak a little on uh the Nubian language society, I know it was founded in Sudan in the early two thousands, but you know faced persecution obviously in Sudan, and so if you could if you could speak on that maybe because I know a lot of Sudanese here would, um, especially our our elders can relate to that. Um. Sure, Sister Lida, thank you very much. Um, yes, in 2005, 
there was a big event in Sudan. It was a turning point for the Sudanese people. It was the time where the SPLM, or S the, the Sudanese liberation movement, led by Jungarang from the south, who are calling for diverse Sudan, and the national uh, party, I think it was this Bashir regime, signed a treaty, an agreement called the peace agreement. And this was the first time in the history of Sudan since its dependence that this, treat, this treaty or this agreement recognized the, the African dimension of Sudan represented in the language. And there was a term in this agreement talking about freedom of expression and freedom of language you know, teaching. We took this initiative, this opportunity at that time. We were young youth Nubian, and we formed the Nubian Lang Society in the Nubian club in, in the center of Khartoum, um, in an area called Khartoum too. And we were very excited, you know, and enthusiastic, you know, to move with the movement of all the marginalized people of Sudan. We took this opportunity to form. And we had our first meeting, I think that was in January, 2005. And in like two, three months later, we had, you know, the body formed and was many other Nubian elders helping us like Ustaz Al-Hadi, Dr. Sabbar, Abdul Halim Sabbar, other people from everywhere. So in, in in the beginning, we were from all Nile Nubians. And later, like one year or two, we've been expanding. So we had people from Nubal Mountain, we had people from Darfur, they had the same visions. So from the beginning, the Nubian Lang Society, if there is a unique thing about it, it was thinking of the whole Sudan as Nubia. So we don't have this, you know, uh, we, we're like anti-racism, our anti-racist body from everywhere. So we're thinking like all Sudanese should enjoy, you know, uh, the place of Nubia, enjoy the culture of Nubia. We want to make the culture uh, of the culture components of Nubia accessible to everyone in Sudan. And of course, the, the, the policy of the government was against that. So we had to go through struggles, especially we have some issues, tough issues about, uh, you know, during that time, 2005, later the consequences, the 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 loss of Dr. Jungaran himself as you know, as the leader of this project, and the loss of you know of the momentum, and then we had to go through struggles, and we passed through different type of persecutions. I've been arrested for some time, and other colleagues from the NLS, and especially when we're defending, you know. Cases like in Nubal Mountain, you know, cases in Darfur, that time was Darfur was very prominent, very on the service. And we were working closely with those people. So we have to and somehow involve in politics. So we try to keep the body away from politics. However, sometimes it's very hard to do that. I see and um, I see Professor Tajil uh, is raising a hand. So yeah. welcome. Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am the same badge as Abdullah Sabbar, Abdullah the architect, who is the brother of Abdul Halim Sabbar. And I had the honor of meeting Abdul Halim several times. Yes, and I have his book on the yes. language that was printed after he passed away. Yes, yes, sir. That's true. Uh, a, a couple of questions for, uh, for you, sir. Sure. It is not only the language that have survived all the conspiracies. There are so many social practices. Yes. The Jirtik. Yes. The Sarah. Yes, that's true. <laughs> taking the children, the newborns to the River Nile and washing them up. That's true, yes. Yeah. Lighting a fire and jumping seven times across it. That's true. All that all that is Nubian. It is practiced until and until today. Yes. And if you drive from Khartoum North up to Sai Island, Sai Island is the only island which was not submerged. submerged. Yes. You find a lot of arts and drawings yes. 
on the on the uh, on the walls of uh, of, of of the houses. Yeah. So once you go past Shendi, you see that Nubia, Nubians, and Nubian heritage, including the giant of the giant of Tumbus. Yeah. You see it visible. Yeah. My question to you is: in in your expert opinion, how can we revive the language instead of putting it as an elitist issue? like us, I mean, we're only 19, 20 people. And I have been to so many of these elitist groups. Every four years, there is an international Nubian conference. One was, the last one was in Paris. Uh, I think it was in Warsaw, the, before that it was Paris. Before that it was New Chatel in Switzerland. And Abdullah Sabbar and I always go, always we attend this. Yeah. But it's an elitist thing. Yes. Do you have any idea how we can make this more popular? How can we go out to the younger generation? Thank you. How can we revive the language, whatever that language you are talking about? How can we revive it and make it a live language acknowledged and endorsed by the state? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Professor, for this question. Yes, and I think this is a key question. Thank you for the question itself. Yes, the Nubian Language Society, one of its, one of the, when we're working with the community, because we are a community based, we don't have strong voice. We realize and that our case is not ours. Meaning here, the Nubian case, like, should be a Sudanese, okay? national and we see all the conferences all the publications all the scholars are from the west so we feel like here that our case is colonized and this is actually one of our struggles and some of our elders suggested that we cannot fight everybody we cannot fight the the government and fight the westerns but to be honest with you, the Westerners are influenced and our, our struggle with the Westerners, especially these Europeans, who are colonizing our case today, who are making it more looks like elite. They don't want us, to, don't want our case to be publicly for all Sudanese. You see here, if you go to the these conferences, who are talking about the 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 grammar, this publications, only Western scholars who have no interest to look for this uh, young generation of Sudanese. They only consider talking about, you know, their, you know, academic, you know, accomplishment and their ideas. So the first, to, to answer you, the first thing, list. Firstly, consider nationalize our case. The only people who can develop their language are the African minds themselves who have created these minds. So what we are doing now, while well, we teach our students, and you can check with our classes, that we teach them that you as Nubian, the first thing you have to do when I speak Nubian here, I speak about Sudanese, African, and beyond, Sudan and beyond. You have to claim your heritage. You have to claim your heritage. The second thing, we have to trust our each other. Like, why they become the source of knowledge? Why only the conferences of Nubia are, is, are established in Europe and, and the West? Why we don't see that in Sudan? Why there is no initiative from us as community to do that? So the first thing we claim it and we say, no, we, so we, we will welcome people like you working in that. Maybe you know way much better than those scholars of, but the, they only care about their, you know, academic approach and they have their own agenda, by the way. And NLS, you can find analysts in those, you know, prestigious 
conferences, but you can find us in the villages of Halfa and in Sukkot and in Mahas and in Nuba Mountain. And then I'm well known in, to the popular people, pop, in the, to, the, to the normal people than the others. And this is how we, we have decided to go. And I hope that answers your question. And thank you very much, Professor. I see here Selma is raising hand. Do you have questions, Selma and Baba? Yes. Um, hi. Yeah, that, that's my dad. <laughs> um, yeah. So I really enjoyed your presentation. I believe I've heard you present before, and it's always very empowering and very yeah. eye-opening. So thank you very much. Thank you, Selma. Um, yeah, so my question for you is, um, so my my curiosities and my my interests are um, similar to that of my dad's, but I also am very fascinated with how Nubia. I think we lost Selma. Yes. Sorry, I think I mute. Uh, yes. I think I muted myself. Um, so I've also been um, very interested with how Nubia has become like a symbol of blackness and a symbol of black empowerment for the broader Black community, not just Sudanese um, and East Africans, especially African Americans who can't locate exactly which country in Africa they're from because of their histories. Um, I find I'm very fascinated with, with how and why African Americans have so specifically have taken Nubia as a symbol of Blackness specifically. Um, so I was wondering if you could, yeah, maybe um, provide a bit of information about how that sort of happened and how we can keep that going. Because I personally, as, as a Sudanese, I love that African-Americans use Nubia um, as this symbol of blackness. So how can we keep encouraging that and connect them with the history? And also why do you think that they're doing it in the first place and how did that happen? Thank you very much, Selma. I think this is a big question and I think it's very important, very significant question, yes. In fact, actually, I think that happens at least uh, two centuries ago when the African American they studied the history of Africa and they come across uh, Ikemet and Nubia and they discovered that those are very important and especially uh, after the work of um, some African scholars like Sheikh Anta Diub and and other who worked on the, you know the the movement. And by the way. We are the Nubian Lang Society. We are in in we are in uh, like twinship or maybe partnership with Molefi Asante Institute, who is the founder of a movement of um, of uh, African centricity, one of the key movement who are doing the same thing that we're talking about, and dragging you know, the African community and the African scholars back. And he was maybe one of the first scholars of Africa who wrote a comprehensive uh, book about the history of Africa. So maybe one of the first book written by African mind talking about unique. So he has very inclusive idea about Africa. And he was, he's our professor in the University of Temple. And he also had his own institute uh, teaching his student to do that. So I... We believe uh, we have some students teaching, uh, learning Nubian today and learning the Nubian culture. I have taught some, some of them, at least some professors, some of them, and we, we have seen that shift now for them. And but to have this been really effective, to be really effective, this cannot be you know, done by small uh, societies or community-based societies yeah the the country of sudan itself they have to influence you know the institution of the country of sudan they have to allow you know and adopt this you know this you know recognition of nubia as the center of blackness if we see a center in khartoum doing promoting for that if we see the government of sudan is accepting that so we can ex receive uh, scholars like from African American scholars from Canada from everywhere, and and this will makes will make Sudan and put Sudan in a different position to be the real center for African culture and definitely will dramatically change Sudan for the history of Sudan. But thank you for for your question. Um, my my connection cut out briefly at the start. Could you repeat the name of the of the scholar 
um that you that you mentioned yeah molefe asante molefe keta asante i can share Perfect. his name was lena she can share it with you yeah thank you thank you thank you very much thank you come well, okay. Kamil and Tanu, uh, Kam, Kamil and then Tanu, yes. K Kamil? Oh. Kamil? Yeah, uh, I'm just struggling to get my camera on, so. Uh, no. Yes, Kamil? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. yes. Assalamu <laughs> My name is Kamil Muhammad Idris. I'm father of Lena Idris. Mashallah. I'm very, very interested to uh, I'm very to, to attend this enlightening uh, speech. Uh, uh, Khalil, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Uh, from my own perspective, I'm really happy to see my daughter Lena. Uh, in these kind of uh, initiatives, you know, it was one of my. I am a... Abunenga <laughs> Kamel, maybe we lost him. Okay, Tanut, maybe you can go and then. Sure. So that was one of my struggles, and I'm happy to see these kind of initiatives bringing our, our uh, young generations back to the roots. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, and thank you very much. Uh, and there's a lot of initiatives in the, in the uh, all over the world uh, trying to revive the Nubian culture, Nubian language. So I guess one of the, one of the efforts should be to try and unite or uh, cooperate between all these initiatives and, and, and for the best of the uh, betterment of the Nubian, of promoting the Nubian culture and Nubian language. Yes, Very sir. interested to see these kind of things, and hopefully I'll uh, uh, attend more and probably participate more and more. Thank yeah. you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Abunenga. Thank you. Abunenga, yeah, we'll probably have a lot in common, but maybe you can uh, talk yeah. later on offline. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay. Appreciate I will, it. I will give the chance to Brother Tanut and then Tanut Amun. Yes, uh, brother. Hello, hello, uh, daughters and sons, brothers and sisters. Uh, in this great uh, lecture by my brother, one of our great scholars, uh, Nuban Tod Khalil, and I learn a lot from this lecture, from the, your lecture. This is uh, very uh, great. And thank you very much, uh, my brother. Really, I, I I enjoy the lecture and I enjoy most the attendance of young uh, people, young uh, Nubian, young Sudanese. Language is very important. Language uh, carry the history and the, uh, 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 the culture. As uh, linguists say, language is a container of the culture. So it's very important to know our culture. First, we have to know our language. And uh, our great scholar, uh, Sheikh Anta Diop from Senegal, uh, he's a graduate of uh, Sorbonne University. Yeah. And uh, he have a book, uh, the title of the book, The African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality. This book, here in the United States, the African-American scholars, uh, they call this book the Black Bible, the, the, the Bible of the Black people. So Sheikh Anta Diop in this book, he recommend to study the Nubian languages. And one of them is Nubian, is largely spoken in Sudan and in Egypt. Nubin, uh, the language uh, my brother uh, Nubantu teaches. Uh, that's why uh, language carry a lot of history and a lot of uh, culture. All uh, my brother, the professor, uh, says that uh, he mentioned a lot of traditions of uh, Nubian in Sudan. 
taking the newborn child to the to the river and all this, and uh, even including to that the facial scars we have our ancestors have in their face yeah. and uh, the circumcision, all these traditions are old Nubian traditions, Nubian culture, superior to this uh, other philosophies of Asia and Europe. Uh, it's uh, very important to read this book, uh, book of uh, Sheikh Antadio, The African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality, because he recommend to study uh, Nubian language. The, 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 today is, uh, we know Egypt, it used to be called Kemet in our ancestor time. The, the Kemet Egypt history, Egypt gods and goddesses, all this history exists in Nubian language until today. So language, Nubian language is very important to discover the Sudan civilization and Egypt civilization because Egyptian gods and goddesses are only exist in Nubian language. Uh, I was, uh, I did a, a presentation a uh, few weeks ago at the MKA Institute of Afrocentricity. Uh, it's an institute of Mulefe Tati Asante at uh, uh, Philadelphia about importance of our language and our culture in Africa. So, and why the Nubian language is called uh, Rotana or sub-language by Sudan uh, government and Egypt, uh, Egyptian governments and Sudan governments. So uh, we discover ourselves, our history through the language, everything our old history, our gods and goddesses, and all these practice, it's in the language. And uh, I don't want to talk uh, um, more, but uh, I am so happy to see young generation taking over uh, from the old one. Thank you very much, my brother Nubantod, and thank you uh, all of uh, people who are attending this great lecture. And uh, sorry, I didn't mention my name. My name is Tanut Amun Jirais. I am member of Nubian Language Society. I'm, an, I'm not a teacher, but I help my brother uh, Nubantut and other uh, members. And I am activist and I talk about culture and history uh, of Nubia. And okay. thank you very much. I will stop here. And I would like to hear from the young people. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Tanut. And now I give Professor Tajil Khazin. Uh, sorry to come back again, but I would like to uh, share with you okay. the issue the issue of tonality. Okay. The Arabs came to Sudan. Okay. And the main exodus was during the Fatimite uh, rule. Uh, they sacked the Arabs uh, yes. out, of, out of Egypt because they were troublesome. And instead of going back to the desert, Regrettably, they came to us in Sudan. They changed the language, they changed the religion, but they failed to change the tonality of the people. As we speak today, our music, not only north of Shendi, our music all over Sudan is on pentatonic major. We are on five notes. Oral Maqamat al Arabiya. All of them, they used to be 32, then they were reduced to nine, to eight or seven. Kull al maqamat al arabiya all of them are heptatonic, which is seven notes. There isn't a single country anywhere in the Arab world that are using the pentatonic measure. We, the Nubians, we have got seven known beats. Murjan, Sheikh and Nagrazan, and Nagrazan is one of them. And Nagrazan is the beat of a zikr, a zikr lillah azza wa jalla wa rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I hope that one day you can grace us with this constant. Why on earth 
were the Arabs able to change quite a lot, but they failed to change our tonality. As well, I would like to join the group. If you, I put my email in the. Uh, uh, yeah, please let me let me. I would like to join in, and I would like to learn more than to uh, to contribute. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Professor. This is a really good question, and I think it needs a research paper to answer. Sure. <laughs> it's a big topic, and sure. I will give right. a chance for uh, Thais, Thais S, Thais S. Sorry, th my name? Sorry. No, the other guy who is Thais. Oh, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Assalamu alaikum. I've been doing this in my car. <laughs> very, very, very. Thank you very much. Yes. I'm Thank very you. sorry. I... Yeah. No, no, no. Don't worry. Like you said, Nubi is genderless, so I'm not even thinking about it. <laughs> yes. yes, we're genderless, so. <laughs> exactly. Um, I have to say, like, I loved absolutely everything today, and I'm definitely going to post about y'all and share with my virtual community and probably slide in your emails and be like, come and do more stuff. Um, and I definitely want to sign up for the um, uh, for the language uh, classes as well, too. So in Sudan, my family, like we're Baghdad, we're Misaria. So I'm wondering which one would be like the closest to that region. Um, like my family is from North Kudrifan. Um, and I saw like you had different category, like the different um, uh, sister sub languages. So I was just wondering if you could tell me which one would be closest to that. Okay. Kudrifan, Northern Kudrifan. In, in Northern Kudrifan, also there's some many Nubian languages. One of the one of the languages that we lost sadly in in the early 20s is called the language of Haraza. Haraza. And the language of Haraza, okay, or uh, the people who speak that is called the Walid. Mm -hmm. Those are the native uh, inhabitants of Al Bara and Al Lubayid and Northern Kurdufan. And I met some of their elders who have been documented. I think one of the scholar, Herman Bell, he did a, a list of documentations, but they didn't do good well. Mm. And but we work with some of the Nuba Mountain people in, in our network, and we were able to reach out. And I met some of these people. They have lost many of the words, but they still keep, the, this old elder guy, this very like 70, still keep some words. But he talked more about the culture, just like Professor Taj, he said, he talked about the music, their tradition, how they eat. And I can assure you, all the land of Sudan is Nubian. And Nubian <laughs> is very diverse. We don't have one form of Nubian language. We don't have one form of Nubian people. We are very diverse. And that makes us a very unique nation. Okay. Mm, I love that. And so to that point, uh, like you're such a wealth of knowledge. And for me, I've, I've been looking for a long time for something. And I think it speaks to like the struggle for people who like want to reclaim or want to reconnect. Um, right now, like my generation and the generation after me, everything's on social media. And one of the things I've noticed is um, there has been a bit of uh, co-opting by um like african americans like here's the real nubian language here's the real nubian culture here's the real this here's the real this and they have like these big pages these big followings and at the same time none of them have ever actually even been there <laughs> or even like gone to any of the villages so one thing that i really would love to see is how can we create more of even just a social media presence because it is really important for folks to be able to have easy access to know where to go when we're thinking about like that outreach like how do we expand and um, show that this is still here this is still alive I again I just wonder like is that an at all a part of uh, the game plan of like really working on building everything there. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, that's a good question. 
we are trying to create so these classes and i i hope you guys i invite you all i hope you can enjoy the you know attending one of our classes we try to create this virtual you know connection with ancient mm -hmm. sudan and you like identity and uh this is available to you here but mm -hmm. thinking about reconnecting yourself with sudan we can we can maybe think like you guys we can have like a deeper discussion how we can organize trips and this will also encourage you know tourism to northern sudan western sudan and there's so many beautiful places all over sudan maybe after the war maybe this one yes. of the <laughs> yeah not right now <laughs> that you do it you young generation of sudan here of nubia i kind of call you young generation of nubia who have been in the diaspora here can play a key role in reconnecting, you know, the world to Nubia and, you know, inviting everybody everywhere. So thank you very much for your question. That's, that's you. I'm going to be bugging you about it. So I'll be in your yeah. email because yeah, I have some ideas. Welcome. welcome <laughs> I have some ideas. So I'll be bugging you. <laughs> thank you. And do you have more questions? And at the Tanu Tamun, do you have a question or comment? No, no uh, uh, I, I don't I don't have a question. Sorry, uh, I didn't uh, remove my hand, but uh, I just recommend to these young people to read the book of uh, Sheikh Anta Diop, The African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality, because he in that book recommend studying Nubian language to discover the, the Nile Valley civilization. Where the studying history, uh, language, anthropology, all these are very important, but uh, studying the language, it will take you uh, to understand Nile Valley civilization, Nubian civilization, and Egypt civilization together. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, also, if one day you could go back to the Nubian Exodus, 1964, Okay. And the 27 villages that were completely submerged yes. until eternity. And all the islands that were submerged until we got to Sai Island, the one that was saved. Yeah. And our people were taken from their habitat in the northern part of Sudan to a place where the rainfall was about 200 inches per year. And all their requests and their plans and their consultations were completely ignored. And Hassan Dafa'Allah wrote a very good book. He called it the uh, Nubian Exodus. Yes. It has, I was very happy to see it translated into Arabic recently and I got a copy of the Arabic translation. Yes. 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 Uh, Harvard University has invited me and my daughter Selma to write a chapter in a book. We are good friends of Rita Fried. I don't know if you know Rita. Yeah, no, we know her. Yes. yes. Right. In the museum. Yes. It's That's right. right. Museum. Uh, yeah. And she they are writing a book of 10 chapters and Selma and I were asked to write about Nubia today. Okay. And I consulted with her and I am going to write about the Nubian exodus. Okay. One thing that came in the book of Hassan Dafa'Allah, and I want to share it with you. There was a woman in Halfa, yes. and the train was waiting to take them to Khashwal uh, Girba. And she said, no, wait, wait, wait. And she started running towards her house. When she came back, they shouted at her and they said, why did you run back to your house? She said, I forgot to lock the door from outside. The Nubians don't lock their doors from inside. Nobody steals. They lock the door only so that the animals do not leave the house. There are so much values, human values, that we can learn from our Nubian people. Sure. I hope one day you will talk about the Exodus and I will be there to raise my hand for you. Thank you, sir. Definitely, sure. That's needs really yeah. a, a dedicated session to talk about this experience. Very great and sad experience. Thank you very sure. much, Professor. Sure, for sure. thank you. Sure.
Lena, the floor is yours now if there's no more questions. Yeah, no. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, if you want to please check out their website. And I think Ustaz Nubidot sent his emails in the chat if you'd like to join any of the language acquisition programs. Um, I'd recommend Nubian. I think it's one of the easier languages to start with. Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, yeah, definitely uh, send an email and reach out um, if you'd like to learn more. Um, and I know there's no thank you in Nub in the Nubian languages, but because it from our, you know, no di direct translation because our communalist nature. Okay. But, but okay. <laughs> thank but you guys. Okay, and I think we had, let me share with you what is thank you. Mm. Uh, let me say thank you to you and Nobi. I didn't do it, maybe because, so this is thank you. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Can you read it to them? Yeah. I uka isko isko ilijil. Remember this vowel. You can silent this vowel and just Yes, I thank you. <laughs> so there is a thank you in Nobin. So <laughs> okay. Okay, guys. So Maliruni I thank you all. And uh, it was great discussions. I learned a lot from it too. And uh, I hope I can see you soon. And we can reconnect soon in one of programs, maybe classes, anything, session. And feel free, I left my emails and I also will took your emails. I will send you email and uh, let's be in touch. Thank you again. I've been honored. Thank you, Lena, for organizing this session. Thank you guys for attending that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.